By 1994, even the refreshing taste of grunge had staled. America was ready for some sun to break through Seattle's fog. A lot of the guys at our school that were really into it were really kind of lame, and I just didn't really like the music. And I didn't really feel like it was fun or exciting or really saying anything to me. I thought a lot of the, the grunge bands were nothing but arena rock bands, but you know, but you know, with they haven't washed their hair. <laughs> they were boring, it was all introverted, and it really didn't say anything. And here comes Dookie at just the right time, and it has just the right songs, and these kids are just the right kids to do it. Dookie was released on February 1st of 1994, but the label wasn't expecting much. I thought it was going to sell 100,000 records. That we thought, like, you know, yeah, there's 100,000 cool kids that remember what punk is, remember what this type of rock music was about. For Green Day, sales figures and marketing plans were of little interest. I knew that we liked the songs, and amongst us, we had a good record. Whether anybody else was going to get it or like it, it kind of doesn't matter. I knew we had a really special record. How far it was going to take us, I have no idea. Cavallo helped orchestrate Longview's evolution from fuzzy demo to radio-ready anthem. He believed American kids would relate to the song's restless message, and his covert calls to radio helped assure they'd have that chance. I would call K-Rock like, you know, two or three times a night during those during that crucial, you know, month or two when the record was just on the verge, I'd call up and I'd say, and I heard the song, it was just great, you know. <laughs> and I'd make up some name. Look at his mouth. <sighs> yeah, yeah. It's all encrustulated with globules and feces. <laughs> See what I mean, Beavis? Music television smeared Dookie across its airwaves. The Longview clip, shot entirely inside the band's unkempt Berkeley crash pad, epitomized an era where high style meant being yourself. I'm feeling like a dog in heat, barred and doors on the summer street. It's like, all right, just go nuts like you do on stage. That was easy enough to do. And then looking back, going, boy, we have a lot of zits. <laughs> Just show our, our pad, show the band, show all our zits. That tiny little bathroom you see in there and that sink dripping, that's our sink. That's our, our one pan that we had with the butter. Usually, the people you see on MTV are all like, really tall and skinny and beautiful, but then Green Day was on MTV and they're short and funny looking. I mean, they're cute, totally, but you know, they're not like the normal cute person. And I always kind of laugh when I think about it because it was on MTV, it was huge on the radio, like mothers were letting their kids buy this song, you know, and I think that, I think a lot of people didn't know what it was about back then. Dookie Mania spread a punk rock virus of insurgency. Legions of youngsters rushed record shop counters to buy their own chunk of defiance. What I think it is is just not really giving a You know, and just kind of letting go and just being yourself and kind of going against the grain. With Green Day running point, the cult of punk went platinum in 1994. Gilman Street alums rancid and new schoolers The Offspring suddenly sold millions. Hardcore veterans like Bad Religion racked up previously unthinkable sales. Dookie was an uh, absolute explosion of popularity for everything associated with punk rock. My own group had a gold record that year. We'd never gotten close to gold. It just it carried everything with it. Punk's flippant fashion sense and contrary ideals redefined teenage cool. Giving the finger was the new hello. Rebellion was the new resignation. Green hair dye flew off shelves. And mall dwellers got mohawks. I love Welcome to Paradise. It's my favorite. We're naming our prom theme after it, too. I'm like, yeah. I remember when you could buy, like, the glitter 
shirt at the mall that said punk rock. It had like a glitter safety pin. I was like, you know, I think this is over now. Hardcore punks were outruled. Longview was an undeniable smash. And the second single basket case was barreling upwards right behind it. Dookie was doing the impossible. I said, you know, you guys, you're You've done it. You're, you're gonna. You're go you've made it. Like this album's going platinum for sure. I can feel it. I know it. The people at Warner Brothers are saying it, and they were very cool about it. They were sort of like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> that's really good." Dookie was speeding Rebel Rock into the status quo, and Green Day were taking the Outcasts along for the ride. For their first national headlining tour in July of '94, the band asked along an opener to reflect their continued solidarity with the counterculture. San Francisco's Pansy Division played overtly homosexual pop songs. There were a few songs that would really get people going one way or the other. Close inspection of Dookie reveals Green Day's chosen opener made perfect sense. Their song, Coming Clean, is a punk rock invitation out of the closet, delivered with deepest empathy for those fearing rejection. Sexuality is something definitely I've questioned before in my life. You know, I think I think most men have, but most men are wouldn't admit to that. America was fine with Green Day coming clean, but Pansy songs extolling the ecstasy of gay sex were sometimes more than the Heartland could handle. There was a show in Fairfax, Virginia, where uh, the promoter did not want us on the bill, so Green Day said. If Pansy Division don't play, we don't play. We played the show. And the promoter came back and gave me a 15-minute lecture about how we thought our songs were inappropriate for 12-year-old kids. Homosexuality is one of the last great frontiers where you can really, really get people going and really piss people off. So that could have been part of it. Also, maybe they were just trying to give a message that it's no big deal to be gay. I was alone. I think that at the time, the impact may not have been real obvious, but certainly since 1994, the impact has been huge. It's one of several things that have happened in the last decade that have made homosexuality incredibly more welcomed in America. By the summer of 94, Green Day's Longview and Basket Case had both gone number one. In August, as Dookie's sales passed the million marker, Green Day dropped by the revived Woodstock Festival to galvanize Generation X in a hail of pop, punk, and mud. Woodstock was insane. Just looking out and, and seeing, like, just the massive amounts of people. It's like, wow, we look like deer in headlights up there. <laughs> Don't hurt us. And that's when things for me was like, wow, this is huge, you know, and this is not going to stop. Woodstock and the third number one single, When I Come Around, propelled Dookie from punk phenomenon to timeless rock institution. By the end of 1994, three million people and counting owned and lived Dookie. Wow.